Interested in the Science Smart Gen Mitsu 3020 Pro Max? Then stick around because that's what we're covering in this episode. Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of James Dean Designs. If you're new to the channel and love CNC, hit that subscribe button in the corner to get all the latest videos. And in today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Science Smart Gen Mitsu 3020 Pro Max. Now I have to say thank you to Science Smart straight away. They've been very kind to send me this before it has actually been released to the market. So if anything changes in terms of the official setup instructions, I'll put an update in the description area below the video. Do check that area out. It's where I'll put all the useful information such as bits and files that we may use throughout the videos. Now what we're going to do today is get everything unboxed, check out what you get in the kit itself, get it all assembled, do some testing at the end to see what its capabilities are. But what we're gonna do first is talk about the specifications of this machine. We basically know this is a 3018 Pro on steroids. So te let's take a look at what those upgrades are and what makes this particular machine so special. So the information you all want to know. Well, it looks like the 3018 Pro, but when it comes to the numbers, there are some differences. The width of your work area is 300 millimeters wide, but the Y travel is now 200 millimeters wide, giving you an extra 20 millimeters on that. More crucially, the Z travel is now 72 millimeters. So comparison to uh, 3018 Pro, which I think is 40 millimeters, that's a significant increase on how much your Z can go up and down. Now the footprint of the machine is 391 millimeters deep, 461 millimeters deep, and around 360 millimeters high, obviously depending on how high or low you fit your spindle into that. Obviously for the um, terms of an enclosure or something, you want to add a little bit onto that to give yourself a bit of breathing room. Now the machine itself, obviously you can see straight away one of the biggest improvements, it is now all metal. All the Bakelite side plates and things have all gone. It's all made out of aluminium, obviously with the rails and stuff being steel. So that just really increases how solid this machine is. The Z assembly as well, again, is all metal and that's to enable to support this 300 watt air cooled spindle. This is fitted with an ER11 collet as well. So if you already have a machine that takes an ER11 collet, you can continue to use the same nuts, inserts, and crucially the same um, CNC bits as well. Now to support this all metal Z assembly, one of the biggest upgrades is the fitting of linear rails on the X axis. This just adds so much extra support to um, this whole setup here and really makes it solid, enabling us to be able to machine harder materials, which is obviously one of the main focuses of this new machine. Now the bed is cast aluminium with lots of pre-threaded holes to be able to put your clamps in. Again, it's just a really nice feature and if I'm honest, it looks really cool. It's got a grid engraved on it on top of it as well with some numbers running um, on the different axes to help with alignment and sizing. This also sits on two upgraded rails. Now these are 12 millimeters in diameter, which given that they're only 300 millimeters long, they're really solid and just takes any movement out of the bed itself. The thread rods are now um, connected with upgraded couplers, as you can see, much bigger, much better grip just to minimize any of that slipping when you are pushing the machine a little bit too hard. Um, they've also been fitted with knobs on the end of each um, thread rod to allow you to move things around a bit more um, to manually, to be honest. <laughs> The uh, electronics, let's talk about those. So obviously one thing that a Pro didn't have was limit switches, but the Pro did have them. So kind of what they've done is taken some of the best features from the two different machines and incorporated them into this. So you've got three limit switches on each, um, one on each axis with an optional fourth limit switch for the bottom of the Z, which they do supply you that as well. The three limit switches allow you to home the machine, which is a nice useful feature to always return to the same position. Remember the coordinates of jobs. There are different uses for it, so it's a nice feature to have. Um, also an e-stop fitted on the far right hand side. Safety feature, should anything go wrong, just hit it, completely shuts the machine down and minimizes any damage. Um, what else can we talk about? Um, they supply you with an insert for the um, Z carriage to be able to take a laser as well. And obviously the laser can then connect to the control board itself. So again, you can use this for spindle work or for a laser. 
Um, it's not been released yet, but it can also take a fourth axis. There's an extra connection on the control board to allow a fourth axis for this. So when Saint Smart released that again, it's going to be a really cool feature and upgrade. Now, I think that pretty much covers the specifications of this machine. So let's move on. So with the numbers and specifications out the way, it's safe to say there are a lot of useful upgrades in the machine that are really gonna help us out. So let's move on, unbox everything and show you the extra bits that you get in the kit and then move on to getting it all assembled. So after unpacking everything, you can see we get quite a bit in the box itself. We've obviously got the base, which is the Y axis and the bed. We've got the X axis and the Z assembly. Now all of this comes 90% complete. There's just a few things we've got to do to finish it off, which we'll move on to shortly. We have the power pack, we have the control board, a 300 watt air cooled spindle. We've got a USB cable, an emergency stop button, offline controller, limit switches. We have an adapter ring. This goes in here to take a standard through a 33 mil laser. So that can be very useful. Extra cables to connect all the stepper motors up and cable tidies. Obviously a set of V bits that come with the machine. Then various bolts and accessories to allow us to assemble this and get it all wired up correctly. So yeah, you really do get quite a bit of kit in this box. Now I'm very cautious. Before I start assembling this, any bolts that are in awkward positions such as the bottom of the Z assembly or underneath the bed, I like to go around and make sure they are tight before I start assembling anything. It's also a good time to talk about Loctite. Now I've mentioned this before in previous videos. Essentially this is a bit like a soft glue that helps hold bolts in place. Now this machine is very sturdy and is unlikely to need it. However, it is a safety precaution if you want to use it. You just take the bolts out, apply a slight drop and put the bolts back in and it will hold them more secure. You're not going to see me use it during the video purely because it can get messy if I have to take bolts back out to reshoot, but it is something to consider. So for the first part of the assembly, we're going to drop in the spring T-nuts. These have a slight sprung ball bearing on the back and they're designed to sit in there and not come out very easily. So do be careful when you put them in. The hole is offset from the center. The hole is closer to one side than the other. And when you're placing them in, the hole should be towards the front of the machine. We have eight in total for each side. So that is four on the top slot and four on the bottom slot. We'll then flip it around and do the other side and exactly the same. When we flip it around, remember again, the holes should be facing towards the front. The instructions say these holes should be spaced 20 millimeters apart. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm gonna rest the first on the top and bottom at the back of the frame and then space the holes out roughly 20 millimeters and we'll do the same on the other side. So we're going to do exactly the same again, but on the opposite side. Now, obviously we've spun it round, so the holes that are offset need to go towards the front, which is now the opposite end. So we'll drop these all in again, make sure they click in. I have noticed some are a little bit tighter than others, some are a bit loose. So just put them in the best you can and when we come to bolt it up, all being well, everything should align. Just gonna drop these in and click them and I'll finish the rest of this off now. So they're all in and again spaced 20 millimeters apart so we can now bring the x-axis gantry in, drop that in place and start to get the bolts in. So this next step is going to be one of the fiddliest parts of the setup because we've got to get all the holes aligned to the nuts that are in position. Now as a quick tip, if you turn the rubber foot out slightly, it will protrude a bit further than the extrusion itself and it will just allow the x-axis or the x-assembly to sit on top of it. So if I lower this in place, just keeping it aligned with the back of the frame itself as we can see there and then it should make it much easier to get the bolt in and align that because it is the correct height. Now I'm going to go around and do the eight on this side and then the eight on the other side. What I would suggest doing at this point just do them finger tight. We don't want to tighten them up too much because we've got to adjust the back depth of this shortly. So I'll continue and finish this off now. So I did the other side, I've just put two in the opposite side so it could spin it round without me disturbing everything. Now I'm going to continue to put the other six bolts in this side as well. You do need to wiggle it about a bit just to find the centre of those nuts. But once you actually get a few in place, everything starts to align up and it makes it really easy and fast just to drop them all in. 
So I've just tightened all these to finger tight, so there is still a little bit of play in them. And I've just brought the gantry in till it is 13 millimeters from the back of the frame. You can just do this by wobbling it slightly and it will give you a little bit of movement, but we want 13 millimeters from the edge of this gantry here to the edge of the frame there. I'm just gonna tighten all these up with the Allen key just to get them all pinched up and secure. And then we'll do the same on the other side as well to make sure that gantry is also 13 millimeters in. What we'll also be doing a little bit later is just checking that the gantry is square to the bed itself. Now, you don't want to tighten these up too much just in case you need to adjust this, but we need to tighten it up enough so that we can move things around and for it to stay in place. And then once we've done that check later on for square, we'll come back and pinch all these up fully just to make sure it's tight. So before I tighten all these bolts up, I want to check that the bed is actually square with the assembly itself. So I've just dropped a square through the uh, spindle holder and I can see from looking down there that it aligns square with the spindle holder itself. Just as a secondary check, I'm going to move the bed this way and also put a square on the back to make sure it aligns with the um, aluminium extrusion on the back. Again, just to make sure it's all as square as possible. So obviously I know this square is now leaning off a bit because it's falling forward, but I can also see on the back as well that this is all sitting square. So I'm pretty happy with how this is and I'm gonna make sure we tighten all of those bolts up on either side. It's also a good point at this time with your squares out, just again to check the squareness of the frame just to be safe. We'll get all these bolts pinched up. Make sure everything's secure and then move on to the next step. So the instructions say at this stage to install the feet, but mine already came installed, so we're going to move on and install the e-stop through this hole here. Now the first thing you'll need to do is to remove the washer and the plastic bracket off the end of the e-stop. We're then just going to feed the cable through this hole, pull it all the way through, and the e-stop should sit in there nice and comfortably. You then need to thread the washer and the plastic retaining nut back over the cable itself. I should point out there are slight little claws on these. The way Sane Smart set it up is these point back in towards the machine itself. So we'll slide that on and then we'll slide the nut on as well. Now once in place you'll want to make sure this is pushed all the way through. Slide the washer over, bring the nut back up and then attach that also. Thread it on. Make sure it's pinched nice and tight to hold the e-stop in place. Now we'll cover this a bit later, but obviously once you've done that, make sure you rotate the e-stop so that it pops back out. Obviously that will cause you issues later on if it remains depressed. So we're going to move on and install the limit switches. There is one at the top of the z-axis, one at the far right of the x-axis, and then the one at the front on the y-axis. Now there are two different bolt lengths for this. One is 12 millimeters, the other is 10 millimeters. Now the X and the Y, they both have the 12 millimeter bolt. The one that goes into the Z, that will use the 10 millimeter bolt. So we're gonna work through and put those in. I should also point out, all the limit switches have the same length cable so they can go anywhere. You don't need to put them in a particular order as long as each set has its own limit switch. So we're gonna work around now and put those in. Now you may have just seen I had to lower the z-axis down slightly in order to get the limit switch in. Just make sure that when you are installing them, obviously everything remains away from each other. You, otherwise you won't be able to install them if you haven't left enough gap between them. Now you'll also notice there are two holes at the bottom of the z-axis. This is for an optional z limit switch. Now the difference is the three limit switch that we've already installed allows you to do homing. This optional limit switch is more like a safety device to stop the z-axis from going too low. I'm gonna leave it off for today, but you can install it if you want by doing exactly the same process. So we're about to install the control board and you'll need the M5 10 millimeter bolts with the T-nuts. Now these are hammer T-nuts. What that basically means is they can drop straight into the slots. They don't have to be slid in from the side. So you've got a choice. You can either place them all in and then try and align the holes up or do what I've done here. Put them all on. Just put the nuts on by about one turn and that way you can simply place it in position. The T-nuts will go in, push the bolts in, and then when you start to tighten them up, it will all hold itself in place. 
And to me, that's just a little bit easier than trying to align all the bolts and keep shuffling everything about. So the next stage is to install the spindle. Now your bolts may already be in place on the holder, but if like mine, they may have been separate. So we need to put these in first. You've got a long bolt and a square nut. Now this can be a bit fiddly because those gaps are quite big. So just drop that in, use something like a small screwdriver that actually comes with the kit, place the bolt through and just push it up to it gently and then just try and get that first thread on. And once it grips, you'll be okay then. We're gonna do that with the second bolt as well. The bolts can go in before putting the spindle in because it doesn't apply pressure until you really start to tighten them up a little bit at the end. So we'll just get this one in place as well. There we are, they're both just gripped now. Now what we can do is drop the spindle in and tighten both of those up. So I'm keeping the wires to the spindle to the right hand side so it's closer to the control board. And once you drop the spindle in, you wanna lower it down quite a bit, but leave a bit of a gap between the wire and the holder itself. And then just tighten the bolts up until it starts to pinch the spindle. Do them evenly as you can as you're going through and it just saves applying uneven pressure to the spindle itself. And once it starts to clamp, it will hold the spindle in place. And then you can just do it with the other way to put the final tightening turn on, make sure it's holding it well. Obviously after doing this, just make sure everything is still turning freely and you're good to go. So we're now going to move on and install the cables for the stepper motors. Now there are two different connectors on either end of the cable. One is a wider connector, the other one is narrower. The wider connector is the one that goes to the stepper motor itself and the narrower connector will go to the control board shortly. Now all the cables are the same length so you can put them in any order so we're just going to work around now and connect them. I should also point out the connectors can only go in one way. There are two arrows on one side of the connector and there are also gaps on the undersides of the connectors on the stepper motors for where these little arrows go. So just place them in and you should feel it click with a little bit of pressure. Now everything is starting to get a bit messy cable wise but we're just going to finish one other thing up and then get all this tidied up. So we now need to fit the extension cable to the spindle to allow it to reach the control board. Now it may sound obvious, but the red goes to the red and the black goes to the black. These are non-return clips, so you don't actually need a screwdriver to use them. You just simply press the button down on the top. It opens up the mouth of the clip itself, and then you slide the cable in there. So once that's open, slot it in, make sure it's in all the way, release it, and that applies enough pressure to stop the cable from being pulled out. We'll do the same with the black as well. Press the button down, slide it in, release it, and it's all gripped up. We're then gonna connect the other end of the extension cable to the control board. Now there is this block of four connectors. The two on the left-hand side are for the power coming into the spindle, the two on the right-hand side are for the power going back out to the spindle, and that's where we'll connect the extension. Now the furthest one to the right is the negative or the black and then the next one in is the red. So we'll simply place both of the connectors into the slots, push them down, make sure they are sitting in there very well and then use the screwdriver provided, just tighten those up and make sure they're clamped in place. Now once you've done so, it's worth just trying to pull them back out to make sure they are secure and those are definitely held in place now. We're now going to connect the remaining cables to the control board. There are terminal blocks at the top and there are blocks at the bottom as well. The ones on top are for the stepper motors, the ones on the bottom are for the limit switches. Now you may notice that certain terminals have two. So for example, we've got one X but two Y. Now as this machine only has one Y stepper motor, there is a spare one. And that's what will be used for the fourth axis when Science Smart release it. Now wherever there are two terminals, safest thing to do is just connected to the first one. So we're gonna go around, we're gonna connect the X, the Y, and the Z stepper motors, then do the same underneath for the limit switches. There are two of each limit switches terminals underneath. Again, we're just gonna connect it to the first one for each. So one for the X, one for the Y, and one for the Z. We'll get on and do that now. Make sure that all of your cables are untangled as you're plugging them in. It just helps keep the cabling much tidier. So we're gonna start by connecting the Z and then move around and do the others. So I'm going to begin by connecting the X limit switch at the bottom. 
So I'm just going to twist that round. Again, the arrows on the connector go towards the gaps on the terminals. So we're just going to slide that in, make sure it clicks. I'm also then going to connect the Z limit switch. Again, we'll do the same. We'll find the Z limit switch, which is here. Push that in. And the reason I've left the Y out is I want to run the cable underneath the board. Now most of the cables are all towards the right hand or the back of the machine. The only one that's of a slight concern is the Y axis limit switch. Now the instructions are not that clear on where to put this. I think I'm going to feed it underneath the rail. And then what I'm going to do is feed it towards the back but underneath the bed itself. And what I will come back and do a little bit later after connecting this is make sure we've got enough play in the cable and try and sit it in the channel underneath here. Either holding it in with a zip tie, a little bit of tape, just to keep it tucked out of the way and minimize anything rubbing or catching on it. And finally, we will connect the Y. As a quick tip before you start to tidy the cables up for the spindle and the Z axis, push everything as far away from the control board as possible, lower the spindle all the way down, and that gives you an indication of how much slack cable you need to leave before tidying everything up. So I'm just going to make sure I've got enough for this to move about and the spindle can go up and down without rubbing on anything. Pinch these cables up maybe with a zip tie, and then start to put the spiral, connect, spiral tidies around everything. So I should start by saying there is no correct way to do this. It's all about just making sure the cables are neat, tidy and secure. Now I've started off by cables any going in the same direction, combining those. So we have the Z-axis stepper motor, the Z-axis limit switch and the spindle power cable all in one here. The X and Y stepper motors I've combined at the bottom and then fed those up in a spiral bind and also the limit switches and done the same there along with the E-stop and then combine those two together with a couple of zip ties. Now will I change this going forward? I may, it depends on whether I feel that anything can be improved with the way I've secured these in. One thing I should point out is that when you've got something like the setup over here, where you've got the X axis constantly moving and the Z carriage going up and down, you may consider using something more secure to hold this cable down to the carriage itself and minimise any unnecessary pressure on these terminals as it's going back and forth. So I'll probably look at making that improvement in the future, but for now I'm happy with the way this is. Let's make the final connection that we need, which is now putting the PSU, the power supply, into the control board. Similar scenario again, we have a red wire and a black wire marked up as positive and negative. So we'll place those both into the terminals. A little bit of pressure to push them in, make sure they are sitting well. Come back in with the screwdriver, tighten them up. And again, just make sure everything is secure tight try pulling them out make sure they don't move and that's that done so a very simple set of procedure which is exactly what we want from a machine like this so now let's move on get everything ready for our first test cut and then after that we'll do a couple of additional cuts just to see what the machine's capable of so let's physically get the machine set up. Obviously to begin with, we'll need a scrap piece of material to do a test. I'm just gonna be using an off cut of pine today. It can be a bit fibrous and doesn't always machine the best, but for a test, it's absolutely fine. Now, quick tip from me, always um, clamp your material down or secure your material before installing the bit. If you're moving around underneath and you've got a sharp bit in, you can run the risk of hitting your fingers. Now we're going to be using the clamps today. I usually prefer blue tape and CA glue, but we're going to use the clamps because they come in the kit. The correct way to set them up is to have the normal bolt going through the wider gap with the wing nut and the washer below it. Have the cross head nut going upwards and that basically acts as a foot for the clamp. So you then come over to one of the threaded holes and just give it a couple of turns. Make sure that it is well gripped. If it's only got something like half a turn, when you start to apply the upward pressure, it runs the risk of damaging the thread. So you want to make sure it's got a good couple of turns in there. The other crucial part is you always want the plate to be facing slightly down or at least parallel. If it goes the other way where it's pointing upwards and away from the material, it effectively pushes the material away from it and you run the risk of obviously your material coming loose. So I'm just going to turn that down just a little bit try and get it close to parallel and then pinch up the wing nut just to ensure that this is clamped down. This can be a little bit fiddly but they do ultimately work as clamps. Obviously as you're tightening it up make sure everything's aligned on the bed and that just helps keep everything neater. So we'll give that a pinch up. I'm going to do the same on this side now and put that in place. Now obviously one thing to note 
So I'm quite close to the edge of the bed here. So you can either put these at an angle um, just to ensure that it grips down. And that just minimizes obviously the side bolt coming off the edge of the bed itself. Now the test file that we're doing today is about 50 millimeters wide. So I've got all this area to play with. If you are doing a design that comes close to the edge, obviously be careful where you put the position of the clamps as if they're close to corners, it can often interfere with that. So let's move on and install a bit now. Now the bits that come with the kit are 20 degree V bits. They are extremely sharp. So I always leave the cap on whilst fitting. Don't know if the camera can just pick up on that. There's a machined flat edge and then a ridge right there. I'll show you where that ridge goes in terms of inserting it shortly. But I'm gonna put the cap back on and then make sure your nut is loose and that should just slide up nice and easy. Hold it in place and then just tighten the nut up with your hand and it will start to pinch the bit up. Now once it's pinched it, use your spanners, tighten this up and just make sure that it's all secured. If you're unsure how deep to put the bit in, these 20 degree V bits have a flat edge in, machined on them with a little ridge at the top. I put that ridge right at the bottom of the collet and that's how deep I like to put them into the ER11 collet. So now we're on the PC, let's get everything set up. Obviously some of you may be familiar with this process so you can skip ahead if you just wanna see some of the results further into the video. But we're gonna start by opening up the memory stick. So plug in the memory stick to your PC or laptop and then open the folder up. And you should see a selection of files or folders that look something like this. We're going to begin by going into the software folder and then opening up the driver folder. Now the driver allows your machine to talk to your PC or laptop and therefore can communicate and get your jobs done. So we're going to open this file up. Now the screen will go dark for a second and it is just a security message. Click yes and then you'll be presented with this screen here. Click install, let it run through and once it's complete we can then click OK. There we are, click OK, close all this down, and that's the driver installed. Now at this point we need to know what port the um now at this point we need to know what port the CNC machine is connected to on the computer. So we're going to come down to the start menu and we're going to type device manager. And then click into this. Once it loads, come down to port, expand the menu, and you should see that something that looks similar to the driver we just installed, CH340. It is on COM6. Make a note of COM6. We'll need that shortly when we open up the control software. So I'm just gonna close this back down. And we're gonna go back one level on the folders. Now, GRBL Control, commonly known as Candle, is the piece of software that they always supply with these desktop machines. If you've seen my previous videos, I don't like Candle. I think it's a little bit glitchy and lacks some features. So for this video, I'm going to be using UGS, or Universal G-Code Sender. If you're unfamiliar with this, you can simply Google UGS, and it's going to be the first result that comes up. Go to the download page, and you can select the relevant installation pack for your setup. I've already got UGS installed so I'm now going to minimize this and open UGS up. So with UGS open we can see our jog controller, the visualization and the console area. If you can't see any of these tabs and settings you can come up to the menus at the top and turn them on on the different plugin options and it just puts the tabs back into place. Now we need to get UGS to connect to the machine. So the first thing we come and do is refresh the port selection and this will just check what ports are available for us to connect to. We just noted that that was COM6 so we're going to select that. You also need to make sure the board rate is correct at 115200. So with both of those settings correct, we can come over to the plug symbol here and click connect. Now it takes a second, but as soon as it loads up, it will give us an alarm state. This is because we've got limit switches installed and the settings know this. So by default, it flags the alarm code just as a safety feature. The first thing we need to do is click unlock and it will release this. 
So with that released, we can now start to control our machine and just test that things are okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is just jog everything about. Just set some low values such as 20 millimeters and make sure everything moves left, right, back and forth. So I'll quickly run through this now. Tested the X and Y, we'll also do the same on the Z axis, just raise it up and then lower it back down. Just as a quick test, I'm going to fire the spindle up and make sure that works. We're going to do this with the console and the command line. So we come down to the command line and we're going to type M3S10,000. Now we should hit enter and this should start the spindle up. To stop it, we'll type M5 and hit enter. So there you go, you've learnt a little bit of G code as well. M3 simply means to start it at a speed of 10,000. The M5 is the signal to stop the spindle. So at this stage, we know everything is running as it should. We've done some basic tests and it jogs about. The next step is for us to load a test file in. So we're going to come up to the open folder and we're going to head to the memory stick and we're going to go into test codes then into Genmitsu logo on wood. And at this point, I'm just going to say a thank you to SaneSmart for listening to people. Now there are two files in this folder. One is called a tap and one is called a text. The one that we actually need is the tap file. However, I'm just going to briefly come back out and open the text file in that folder to show you something. Now one issue I've always had with the um, memory sticks that come with the machines is they don't tell you anything about the test files that they provide you. So if I open this toolpath summary file up, we can see it has some basic information about what is actually in that test file in terms of the feeds, speeds and the bit being used. So we can clearly see the tool is a 20 degree V bit. We can see the rate that it is running at and we can also see the speed that it is estimated to be doing. Now this bit of information is just very useful if you're loading in a file that you have never seen or you didn't create yourself because it just gives you a bit of background about what to do and how it's going to handle it. So we'll close that down. We'll come back over to UGS and we'll open that tap file. Now when it loads in on the visualizer we can see straight away it's the word Gen Mitsu. We can see it's just simply going to cut an outline of each letters and we've got some measurements to support that. So 40 millimeters wide, just over six millimeters long and I'm gonna guess this is 5.5, so five millimeters of safety travel height and 0.5 millimeters of depth into the wood itself. Now this is going to be quite gentle given that it's a soft wood, but we can see from the visualization it will do several light passes before completing the job. So the next thing we need to do is set the Z position or the start position. Now, as we can see from the visualization, this will be beginning in the bottom left hand corner of the test file. So we need to make sure this is the bit on our CNC machine is towards the bottom left hand corner on the test piece of wood. Now I've already roughly got it positioned, but we need to set the height of the Z. So we're gonna lower this down slowly and you just want the tip of the bit to touch the top of the material. Now, if you want to be precise, you can use a Z probe. Check out the links in the corner on how to set up a Z probe, but we're just gonna do this manually for the time being. So we'll set the Z step size to one millimeter and we'll lower it down slowly. So that is now just touching the top of the wood. A good test is if you put a piece of paper underneath the bit and lower it down slowly, when the bit starts to drag on the piece of paper, you know you're pretty much on the top of the material. So because I'm happy with the position on the X, Y and the Z axis, I'm going to come up to this button that says reset zero. And that just remembers the position that it is in now in order to start and finish the job. So with everything set, we can click play and let this do the test run. So a nice easy one to get us started with. It came out clean, there are no missteps, no jagged lines, that sort of thing. So it indicates everything is working as we expect. Let's move on to something a bit more challenging. Now on the memory stick, there are some 3D relief files from Carveco. These are two stage files. It's where you do a roughing pass to clear a lot of the material, and then you do a detail pass at the end. So let's see how we get on with that. 
So the test file I'm about to do now is a 3D relief file from Carveco. We can see it's 84 millimeters on the Y axis and about 144, 140 millimeters on the X axis. Now to find this file, if you go back up to the test codes folder, test files from Carveco, and we've loaded in the 3D Gecko. Now you'll see there are two tap files in here and it gives the name of each bit that you need to use with it. A 3.175 end mill and then a 0.1 conical which is basically a V bit. So we'll come back over to UGS. I've set the position on the piece of scrap wood where I need it to start. Do note the center of this is the starting position not the bottom left as it was in the previous test file. So you need to make sure your bit is set to the center of your material before starting this job. With my bit positioned correctly I'm going to come up and click reset zero to set the new start position and with that loaded we'll click play and get the job started. So this did take quite a few hours to complete, but the result is lovely. Considering how fine of a tip this is, it is so smooth I haven't had to sand anything. And as also mentioned, given that it's pine as well, which can be fibrous, yeah, it's come out really nice. The detail in the fins on its back and underneath its mouth are nice and sharp. There was a slight rough edge around the um, the oval. Now, I don't know if that was as a result of the test file or the machine itself. So if you do this cut as well, let me know how you get on. But considering this is our second cut on this machine, it has come out absolutely brilliant. So I don't think there was any doubt about this machine's capability in terms of its engraving and cutting on wood. I should also mention I did a sound test during that piece as well and it was averaging out at about 68 decibels, maybe a fraction lower. So that's actually pretty quiet and you can still hold a conversation over that whilst the machine's running. So yeah, just a great sign of how quiet this machine can be. Now for the final test, let's move on to something a bit more challenging. I've got a piece of aluminium bar that I'm going to try and engrave. Now I should mention straight away, this is my first time engraving metal. The aluminium bar isn't perfectly flat. I've sanded it as flat as I can get it, but there are some minor high and low points, but the machine should hopefully handle that absolutely fine. Now as I say, it is my first time, so I'm taking the feeds and speeds fairly slow and steady. I'm going to be doing 0.1 millimeters per pass at a speed of 400 millimeters per minute. But yeah, let's, uh, let's get this started and see how we get on. And I'm going to be engraving a small JD logo into this around 45 millimeters square. So let's see how we get on. Hopefully it will be a success, but we'll catch up at the end of this video. So even though the bar wasn't perfectly flat, it's actually done a great job of engraving it. The lines are nice and crisp and sharp. The detail is there in the letters with nice sharp edges and everything looks even and flat. Now I know a lot of you think I have plenty of time with these machines to get them set up, dialed in before I start doing any filming. But the truth is everything you've seen in today's video is this machine straight out of the box, no modifications, no, mo no tweaks, no tests that I haven't filmed. So to be able to do a good quality 3D relief carving on my second job, and to be able to do a flawless uh, metal engraving in my third job, and I've never done metal engraving before, I think the results speak for themselves and it shows just how good these upgrades are that Science Smart have made to the machine. And I'm genuinely looking forward to pushing this further and doing more metal work just to see what it really is capable of. Now, is the machine flawless? I always like to ask this question when doing an initial review of a machine. Well, to be honest with you, I am struggling to find things that I dislike about the machine. As I say, it really ticks pretty much every box for me. There is one niggly little thing. I think Science Smart could have put the e-stop in a slightly better position. Um, the terminals from it kind of stick into where the work area is near that limit switch as well. So I just think that that probably could have done been done a little bit cleaner if Science Smart are watching. Maybe a smaller e-stop or just rotate it around 90 degrees. You know, just a, just a suggestion. Now, I have no doubt that some of you are going to come forward and say, why didn't they do this upgrade? Why didn't they go with that part? The honest answer is I don't really know. I'm not saying smart, you'll have to ask them. But if I had to guess, I would say one of two reasons. Either those upgrades would push into the next price bracket and therefore out of reach of a lot of people, 
or ultimately because they're not needed. Now, you know, I've put this through some tests already. And I can honestly say the machine is solid. There's no deflection. I am so happy with how far this machine has come from what was the original 3018 Pro. And yet, as I said earlier, looking forward to really pushing it more going forward. Now, at the time of making this video, SoundSmart are about to do an early bird, uh, early release special on this. So I think the price to market is 499 US dollars. Before that, you get a lot of extras like extra bits, a one year subscription to Kafka, which in itself is worth about $180. So actually it is a brilliant offer if you're watching this uh, video just as the machines come out, I would definitely jump on that. Check out the links in the description area if you wanna go ahead and buy that video. But yeah, keep an eye out because I am gonna be doing a lot more with this machine and yeah, having a little bit of fun with it. That is everything for today's video. I know you're going to have questions, so chat with me down below because I really am excited about this machine and want to talk to you all about it. So yeah, thank you for watching. Final thanks as always goes to my patrons. I'll see you all on the next episode.